We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, we are wrapping up our series today going through the book of Job. So grab a copy of God's Word. You can uh, have the one in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, we want you to have that. And so turn to Job. We're going we're gonna to start there today. Uh, any of you love a good children's story? How many of you, like one of your favorite things is when a, a young child wants to like jump up on your lap and they're handing you a book and like, hey, read this to me. Those books are just some of the best, right? They're all pretty simple in their makeup, right? They all start where everyone's happy and then there's a problem and someone comes along to solve the problem and then at the end, they all live happily ever after, right? That typically is the way a good children's story ends is everybody lives happily ever after. And today we get to see what happens at the end of the story of Job. All right, Job, uh, uh, today I want to give you a, basically an overview of the book uh, to kind of catch us up. If you haven't been here for the whole series and you're thinking, I'm really coming in here at the, the 11th hour, that's all right. I'm going to catch you up real quick. Uh, ultimately, the book of Job is a story uh, about a guy named Job and his friends. And we get to see a little bit of what's happening in the supernatural realm. And ultimately, it's the book. It's a book about hard questions. The book of Job really gives us one essential hard question that we're trying to explore the answer to, that Job is trying to answer, that his friends are trying to answer. And that question is, God, are you good? Are you good? And maybe you can put that in your own words, right? How could a good God allow bad things to happen to people? And so they're exploring these difficult questions together because the whole book opens with the story of Job. And Job is a righteous man. He's, he's not currently living in a pattern of sin. And he's just, he's blessed by God. He's got a lot of stuff. He's got a wonderful family. He's got 10 children that all love each other and get along with each other. He's, he's one of the rich, he's the richest guy in the land. And then we, we get to see a sneak peek into the supernatural realm where we see God essentially gathered together with the heavenly host, with his angels, and Satan comes into the meeting. Satan crashes the staff meeting and essentially says, uh, God, listen, I know you think Job is pretty awesome, but I bet the only reason that Job honors you and, and is, your, is your buddy and does things your way is because you've blessed him. He's got so much blessing in his life. He's got a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of money. got a lot of animals. He's got a beautiful family. And you've just been blessing him. And that's the only reason that he honors you. And God says, listen, let, listen, I'm going to allow us to test this theory. I'm going to let you go and take these things from him and see what happens. And so Job, within a matter of about 15 minutes, finds that he's lost all of his, his uh, animals, he's lost all of his shepherds and his herdsmen and all the, the people that are, a lot of them are probably friends of his. And then to, to really kind of that final gut punch, he, he loses his 10 children. All of his 10 children die all, all at once, all together. And he learns about all this within 15 minutes. And then to add insult to injury, uh, Satan comes back into the story and says, well, let me take away his health. And then certainly he'll curse you. And so Satan goes and takes away Job's health, and Job is covered with boils from head to toe, painful boils and blisters. And, 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 and this whole time, Job never turns on God. He never uh, curses God, and, 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 and he, he definitely has some questions. He definitely makes some foolish assumptions, but he never curses God. And so then it goes into the story where you get to see Job's three friends, they enter in, they start off as really great friends. They sit 
quietly with him as he mourns for seven days. And then, and then they open up their mouths. And what they say after that is not helpful. It's not what a good friend would do. So he's got his three friends and Job, and they're having these conversations back and forth where everybody, essentially what they're doing, right, is they're asking difficult questions. And if we're being honest, the three friends are doing more answering of difficult questions than they're doing asking. But the, the whole theme is difficult questions. I mean, think about one of the questions here. It would be a question like, is God just? Or how could a good God let something like this happen to someone like Job? Now, I bet all of us in this room, you've asked that question before. You have been at a point in your life where something happened to you, someone was taken from you, you lost a job, you lost a home, you lost your health, something happened to you, and in that moment, your instinct was to ask God. Essentially, he's like, God, are you good? Why in the world would you let something like this happen to me? If you really love me, if I'm really one of your children, if you really care about me, why are you picking on me? And maybe it wasn't you. Maybe you saw something that God allowed to happen in the world. You saw a mass shooting somewhere or a, an earthquake that destroyed an entire country and just thousands of dead people because of a terrorist attack. And you look at that situation and you ask a hard question saying, God, the Bible says that you're good. My pastor says that you're just. And, and the, I, I believe all these things technically, but I, I'm really having a hard time understanding how all this fits together. I want to ask you, do you ever ask hard questions about God and faith? I bet you do. And maybe you felt like you're not supposed to or it's not okay to ask those questions. I want you to know that the, the, the faith system that I follow, we call it Christianity, right? In the book of Acts, the believers gathered together, they called themselves Christians. And as a Christian, I want you to know that the, the, the faith system of being a follower of Christ doesn't mean that you have to enter into that with a blind faith, that it's, it's okay. You're never supposed to ask questions. That's not, that's not true. It's okay to ask questions, to go to God with some concerns and frustrations and maybe even some anger and to say, God, I, I don't get what's going on right now, and to ask questions. And so that's what we see so far in this book. Job's been asking questions. His friends have been uh, making some assumptions in their answers, and Job's making some assumptions, and it's gotten a little out of hand. People are doing more than just asking questions. They're starting to answer questions foolishly. So Job has this his core things right, right? He understands the basic truths about who God is, and those things are like an anchor for him that gets him through this storm. But along the way, he makes some very foolish assumptions. And then we, last week, we talked about a fourth guy, a fourth friend who enters into the story. His name was Elihu. And Elihu is the first guy in this whole back and forth scenario who finally speaks some truth into the situation. He speaks some things that are helpful to Job and helpful to the friends. They might not like it or understand it yet, but he says some truth. And then in Job 38, where we're going to start today, we finally get to hear from someone we haven't heard from yet. We get to hear from God. What does God have to say about everything that we've just read throughout this story. And so open up your Bible to Job. We're going to look at Job 38, and we're going to read the first uh, seven verses and a lot more than that today. I don't have time to read all the way from 38 to 42, verse by verse. So I'm going to be skipping, but we're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. All right, here's Job 38, 1. It says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. If we just pause right there for just a second, God says to Job, Job, listen, I'm about to say some things to you, and I want you to know that if you're just standing there, not really uh, being all nonchalant, not really caring about what's about to be said to you, you are going to get knocked over. 
by my words. You need to, you need to, you know, square up a little bit. You need to brace yourself. You need to stand up straight, Joe, because I have some words for you, and I need you to stand up tall and straight and listen to them because I'm going to expect an answer for you from you when I'm done. It kind of reminds me of a, a situation of like a, a, a drill sergeant. If you've ever been to the, the basic training or boot camp or something like that, I never have been, so uh, I'm, I'm not speaking from experience, but if the movies have it right, right? Uh, when, when someone's there and, and the, the, the drill sergeant walks in, right, what does everyone do? They're going to brace themselves like a man. They're going to stand at attention, and they're going to understand that there's, a, there's a, a, a power situation going on here, and that they need to be ready to receive whatever is coming their way with their mouth closed. They need to be able to take, like a man, whatever's coming. And that's what God says to Job. Whatever's coming, Job, I'm going to be pretty direct with you. I'm going to be pretty harsh with you. If you're not careful, I'm going to knock you to the ground. So listen very carefully and brace yourself like a man. And then he goes on. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations? And who laid its cornerstone as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? First of all, can we just appreciate, we now know where Job gets his sarcasm from. I mean, God is speaking to Job and he's essentially saying, Job, who do you think you are? Were you there when all of this was created? Job, were you present when, when all the, the, the whole element of creation was put together and the rules and the laws and all that were formed? Were you there, Job? You seem to have a lot to say, so now I want you to stand up like a man and listen to me because he's going to start asking a lot of rhetorical questions to Job and explaining to Job, you probably should have kept your mouth shut. And then God goes on in verse 8. He says, Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And as I clothed it with cloth or clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, This far and no farther you will come. Here your proud waves must stop. So God goes on to essentially say, Job, do you control nature? Are you the one that tells waves how far up to go and where they must stop? Or, um, or is that me, Job? Am I the one who does that? You see, God's speaking, but he's actually asking a lot of questions right here. And we call those questions rhetorical questions. Because Job knows the answers to the questions. God knows the answers to the questions. Everyone who might have uh, be listening to this conversation right now, that's, that's you and I, we know the answers to God's questions. Let's skip to verse 31. And God says, Can you direct the movement of the stars, binding the cluster of the Pleiades, or loosening the cords of Orion? These are you know, star formations that we all know of, right? These are the Pleiades, the seven little sisters, the stars, and Orion's belt. We like to try to find that in the sky. God's talking about these constellations, and he goes on and mentions another one. He says, can you direct the constellations through the seasons or guide the bear with her cubs? That's another constellation. Across the heavens, do you, Job, know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Essentially what God is saying here too about the stars and the laws of the universe and how they regulate the earth is God saying, listen, Job, I created the laws of the universe. You know, those, those laws of gravity and those laws of thermodynamics and all those laws of nature that hold everything together and make everything work just the way they work. God is saying to Job, I created all that. I want you to know in this room right now, God created science and he gave it to us as a gift. 
He's like, listen, here's a gift called science where you're going to be able to dis- discover some of the laws of nature. You're going to be able to figure out some of the boundaries of how I regulate things and how they work. And I'm going to give this gift of science to you as a gift so you can explore more about who I am and how I did what I did. And God is essentially saying, listen, Job, I created these laws I I know how far up that little wave is going to come up on the sand. I know all these details, not you. And then remember how God created everything. And and sometimes we look at it as if God creates. And and, and when he was done, it's, it's as if Job felt like God created everything and then kind of like disappeared. And that God no longer seemed to really care about what was going on in Job's life. I bet for a lot of you, maybe uh, in middle school, you probably had to do a science project for a science fair. If we're all being honest, right? Mom did it, right? So when your mom did that science fair project for you or whatever, it was probably something that you, you participated in. And at one point you created that thing and you stood by it. You put it on a table and people came by and you were proud of what you created. But the day that thing was over, you got a grade and it was done. You probably never saw that science project again, right? It ended up in a storage closet somewhere because mom was really proud of what she had done or, or it got folded up and put in the trash. You created it and then you abandoned it because it wasn't really that important to you. And Job was feeling like in this season, God, I, I think maybe God is in charge of everything. So he created everything, but then I don't feel like God now cares at all about what happens. He's just kind of watching from a distance. Now, read these next few verses. The next chapter in Job 39, this is what God says. He says, do you know when the wild goats give birth? Have you watched as deer are born in the wild? Do you know how many months they carry their young? Are you aware of the time of their delivery? They crouch down and give birth to their young and deliver their offspring. Their young grow up in open fields, then leave home and never return. Like, why is God talking about, like, baby deer? Here's the, here's the point. You see, God is not a creator who created the world and then left it without any care of what's going on. God is so involved in his creation that he knows when each deer is giving birth. Not only does he know about it, but he says, were you there watching? God is present. He cares about all the little details of nature. He knows when each little plant is going to sprout a new leaf. He knows when the deer is conceived. He knows the whole lifespan of its development. He knows when it's going to give birth. He's there when it leaves its mom and goes off and does its own. He knows all those details about nature, about animals. Well, listen, church, then he certainly cares about you. You have been created in the image of God. No plant was created in the image of God. No deer or goat was created in the image of God. If he has that kind of detailed care over a goat and over, over a deer, what God is trying to say to Job and he's trying to say to us right now is he cares about every detail of your life. He's not absent the way Job claimed in his ignorance. If God is paying this close attention to a baby deer, he's certainly paying attention to you. And then finally, God gets to a place where he asks Job to give an answer. In chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then the Lord said to Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? He's essentially saying, Job, you had a lot to say. You, you wanted to go off and, and decide basically what justice is supposed to look like and apparently whether or not I care about my creation. You had a whole lot to, of assumptions you wanted to make. So now if you're my critic, why don't, you, why don't you try it, Job? Imagine for just a moment that you're sitting courtside at an NBA game and you're watching two teams play 
and you have a whole lot of opinion about one of the players, right? He, he maybe shoots a three and misses and shoots another one and misses, and he goes up for a layup and doesn't make it, and now you're yelling out front, right there from courtside. You're like, hey, man, you stink at this, man. Why don't you should have, you should have passed. Defense, you know, you're yelling all sorts of stuff at this person, air ball, and, and imagine if in that moment the person was just like, all right, time out, <laughs> time out. They take their, their jersey off, they throw it right at your face and say, put it on. You're going in. Oh yeah, you think you know the, the kind of pressure that it, it, it takes to, to play in this game at this level? You're the expert all of a sudden? Put on the jersey and go out and try it. Well, I promise you, if that ever happens to you, you will be the top story on Sports Center that night probably more than Sports Center. You'll make national news. Here's the know-it-all who was trying to tell, you know, Steph Curry how to play basketball. And now here, here's what happened. And you're being wheeled off in some ambulance, you know, like, hey, there to... <laughs> this is what's happening with this conversation. God is saying, you seem to know it all, Job. You had a lot to say. So now I'm going to give you a chance to answer. Another thing it reminds me of And I don't uh, recommend this movie from a theology perspective, okay? If you've ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty. (laughs) So the story of Bruce Almighty, there's a guy who believes that he should have been promoted, that he deserves this next job as a news anchor, and he doesn't get it. So he complains to God saying, God, why are you so bad at this, essentially? And God comes down in the form of Morgan Freeman and says, oh yeah, Bruce, if you're so smart, why don't you try to do my job for a week? And so what happens is he gets all the, the power that God has. Again, not theologically accurate, okay? And he's hearing all these millions of prayers all at once, and he can't handle it. So he decides to, uh, to just command that all, all prayers now are received in the form of email. And so his email account has billions of emails. He can't keep up with them. He's trying to respond as fast as he can. Eventually, he just gives up, and he goes, uh, he basically accepts and and answers yes to every, uh, all in one lump sum. He just says, answer yes to all. You can imagine the kind of chaos that comes from answering every one of your prayer requests with a yes. See, at the end of the day, we recognize that none of us knows how to do what God does except for God. And so God is really trying to really point, he's already told Job to, to stand up like a man and to take what's coming and to hear these words, these harsh words with some you know, real reality and to let, let reality set in. And now he's giving Job an opportunity to say something. You want to hear what Job has to say? Let's keep looking. It says, Job replied to the Lord, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. In a way, we would look at an answer like this and say, Job probably did the smart thing. Job was like, listen, in this situation, I don't, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say another word. I've already spoken more than I should have. Now, what's interesting here is God saying, listen, Job, you don't get out of this that easy. You had a lot to say before. And so for you now to just uh, pretend like you have nothing to say and that you're super humble and you're just going to cover your mouth and not say anything, I'm not going to let you out that easy. So God has something else to say. God speaks again. Let's look at verse 6. It says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Brace yourself like a man. There it is again. Job, stand up straight while I'm talking to you. Because I have some questions for you. And, by the way, Job, you must answer them. I'm not going to let you out of it. Will you discredit my justice and condemn me just to prove that you are right? Are you as strong as God? Can can you thunder with a voice like his? Essentially, God is saying, Job, you had so much to say, and now you're going to pretend that you had nothing to say. I'm not going to let that fly. I remember one time I... uh, there's a town over from where I lived. I, lived. I grew up in Modesto, California, and a town over was this town called Ripon. And Ripon was so small that people there really didn't have anything to do except for get in trouble. And so there was this girl at Ripon High School that invited me to her prom. 
And so I was like, yeah, we went as friends. And so we went to this prom. And like two weeks later, I start hearing rumors that the boy, one of the boys over at Ripon High School is trying to find me so he can like, uh, you know, beat me up. Because, he's, because I took one of the girls from his high school to prom. How dare I do that, right? That's, that was about the, the whole gist of it. And I'm like, what in the world? This guy wants to find me, and I keep hearing rumors. Yeah, he's, uh, you better be careful. Next time you're in Ripon, he's going to find you. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. Uh, well, this guy eventually uh, meets my sister, my baby sister, Kim, and doesn't know that we're related. And he starts uh, being romantically interested in her and asks her to, to prom. <laughs> and I'm kind of at a season in my life where those decisions, I have something to say about them. I'm like, okay, so this guy wants to take you to prom. Well, I, eventually this guy realizes that I'm the one who's uh, the brother, big brother to, to Kim. And he's all of a sudden comes up and he's like, oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm good. I, I wasn't saying nothing. I didn't say nothing. I'm just, I, I wasn't speaking. Uh, we're good. We're good. I'm like, wow, you sure had a lot to say for the last, you know, two months about all the things that you were planning to do to me. And now all of a sudden you realize that there's something in it for you and you have nothing to say? And so God is looking at Job saying, Job, I'm not going to let you out this easy. You're going to really pretend that you have got nothing to say and you got, you're just going to cover your mouth. I'm going to make you answer. And then God's going to go on and he's actually going to introduce, this is kind of interesting, Those anyone in here like dinosaurs? A little bit interested? I believe we're going to be introduced to two spots in the Bible where dinosaurs are mentioned. So God's going to keep speaking. And here's what he says first. He says in Job chapter 40, verse 15, he says, take a look at behemoth. Now, we don't really know what behemoth is. We're not quite sure. Okay. But behemoth is this, this animal, this creature that is described God says, which I made. In other words, God says, look at behemoth, which I created, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. And the sinews of its thighs are knit together, or tightly together. We're like, what what is this thing, this behemoth? He's mentioning an animal that Job would certainly be aware of, that Job is afraid of, that Job and everyone around would say, we don't want to cross this animal because it is big, it's powerful, its tail is like the, the, a cedar. I mean, it's huge. And so a lot of historians or experts, theologians, not everyone, but, but some would actually say that this, this behemoth is this dinosaur called a diplodocus. I'll put a picture up there. It basically like a, it's actually larger than a brontosaurus, which a lot of you might be familiar with. This thing is huge. And God goes up to Job and he says, Job, I want you to think about the behemoth. You know how scared you are and how scared all humans are of something that I created. Right? He starts there. And then he mentions another creature called a leviathan. Let's look at that. Job 41, verse 1, it says, Can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the noose or through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity? He mentions another animal here, and he says, listen, just like the behemoth, the Leviathan can't be tamed by you. It's something that you would try to avoid at all costs. Nobody's going to put a hook down in the water and catch this thing. So what's this, this sea creature that many people would say, well, this was likely the Leviathan. Uh, it's called the, the, the Plesiosaurus. Let's put that up. I don't know about you. But I, I see some sharks back there, and I'm thinking, I don't want to be anywhere near the Leviathan. And, and so we can, we can pull the picture down. Here, here's the point. 
I want you to understand that what God is saying to Job is, listen, you understand that some of the things that I've created, the behemoth and the Leviathan, whether or not they were dinosaurs or another expert might say there's something else, but these are humongous things that would cause a lot of fear amongst any one of us. And he's saying, Job, if you have enough sense to be afraid of that thing, I want to remind you that I created that thing. Job, you might have some awe and some reverent fear of who I am. It might be deep down in there, but I'm not sure it's quite at the level that it should be at. If you fear these things, you should, which you should, should you not fear their creator more. Here's actually how God says it in 41 verse 10. He says, and since no one dares to disturb Leviathan, who then can stand up to me? Can you see why he told Job to square up, to stand up straight? I mean, he's dropping it pretty hard on Job right now. He's not pulling any punches. He's like, Job, who would dare stand up to me? And Job is understanding the weight of some of the foolish things that he said. You see, everything under heaven replies to God, or belongs to God. And so the Job replies, in Job 42, remember God says, Job, you have to speak. I'm going to make you say something. And so in Job 42, the first six verses, we get to see Job's response. And this is super important, all right? What Job says right here is so important. I want to make sure you're paying attention to these words on the screen. Here's what Job says. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything. And that no one can stop you. You asked, who is it that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I, Job says. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. And you said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Now, these verses that are on the screen behind me right now, this is where we're going to take the takeaways that you guys have on your papers, all right? We're going to go quick. I only have about eight minutes. And um, I want you to write down some things that we learn from the kind of the close of Job's story. Before you write down the first one, I want you to think about this for a moment. What happened that changed Job's posture? Because you think about it, Elihu said the exact same things to Job that God is now saying to Job. Elihu was saying, Job, who do you think you are? God is big and great. And, 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 and you're making a bunch of foolish assumptions. Elihu said all these things, and it didn't really change Job's posture. But now, God says these things, and everything is different. I mean, look at that. At Job 42, verse 5, what changed? Here it is. Job says, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. That's what changed. That's the change right there. That's why Job is now sitting amongst the dust and the ashes in repentance because he has seen God with his own eyes. So there's your first one. Number one, the presence of God changes everything. The presence of God changes everything. You see, essentially what happened is Job has experienced the presence of God in a way that he never has before. Now, I want you to understand God is present at all, all places, right? He's omnipresent. So God is present in this room right now. He lives in me as a believer. He lives in you if you're a follower of Jesus. His Holy Spirit resides in you. So I'm not just talking about God just being there. I'm talking about an experience where you get to, uh, unlike most other times, you experience almost physically the presence of God in your life. See, God was present for Job during all of his other conversations. It's just right now that Job has experienced in in almost a physical way the presence of God. And it changes everything about his posture. It changes everything. 
Let me show you another example of this in Scripture. There's a man, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Kings 19, there's a, there's a prophet named Elijah. And he's, he's hiding away. He's scared. He's the only prophet of God left. He's frustrated. He's in kind of a similar situation to Job. He's got a lot of questions. And this is what happens. In verse 11, God says, Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord, don't miss this, the Lord, was the Lord in the windstorm? The presence of the Lord was not in the windstorm, it says. And then it goes on. After the, the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. I don't know about you, but if there was a moment where I'm standing there, and there's a mighty windstorm, and then this huge earthquake, and then this fire, and all this stuff happening around me, it certainly would grab my attention. But Elijah is, is so far, nothing's really changing. He's still sitting there. His posture hasn't changed until the next verse. Well, here's what happens. It says, after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. You see, what, it, what changes everything for Elijah? The presence of God. God wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He was in the still small voice. The presence of God shows up. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. We see another great example of the presence of God changing everything. Uh, there was a, you know, the greatest missionary of all time. Uh, nobody can argue this truth. The greatest missionary to ever live. His name was the Apostle Paul. And before Paul was Paul, he was a guy named Saul. Before God changed his name. And Saul was out persecuting believers. He was putting Christians in prison. He was doing all sorts of terrible things. Until in Acts 9, the presence of God shows up. And Paul's life is changed forever. You see, the presence of God changes everything. Don't miss that. And there's a lot of things that I've noticed in the Christian life that really kind of help to usher in the presence of God. One of the most powerful things is, is music. Worship through music is such a powerful tool to, to welcome in with open arms the presence of God. We know that God loves music. He created music. He's got a choir of angels singing songs over and over again. God loves music. Another thing that really helps to usher in the presence of God is this thing called koinonia. It's a Greek word. We, we translate it to the word fellowship. Now, we, we think of fellowship as just like when you gather together with another person who's a believer. And we kind of give it a real natural definition. But I want you to know fellowship is a supernatural word. It's a, when two believers gather together, what it means, it's kind of like when you have a cell, cell phone and you look and you only have one bar. You only have two bars. You can technically make a phone call. You could probably get to the website or surf Instagram or whatever. It's going to go a little slow, but you have access. But when you get together with other believers, it's like you immediately jump up to five bars. And the access you have to the presence of God grows because you're gathered together with a body of believers in koinonia. Remember the Bible says where two or more are gathered, that God's presence is in the midst of them. So gathering together in a situation like this ushers in the presence of God. Spending time in prayer and reading God's word, that's all going to welcome in and usher in the presence of God in your life. And I want you to know the presence of God changes everything. That's your first point, all right? Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Our perspective of God should lead to worship. If you have a healthy perspective of God... You will not be able to help it. You will bow down in worship. You won't be able to help it. If you're like, you know what? I've never really felt that inclined to worship God. Well, I'm telling you right now, you don't have a healthy perspective of God. I mean, look at Job 42 verse 6. This is what Job does. He says, I take back everything I said and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Why does Job go and sit down in the dust 
and sit down in the ashes. What he's really saying here is, God, now that I've experienced your presence, which changes everything, I realize that I am most at home sitting here among the dirt. When I look at the size of a piece of dust or the size of a little piece of ash under a microscope, I can kind of see how small I really am in comparison to how great you are. You know, there's a telescope called the Webb Telescope. And the Webb Telescope, you ready for this, can see 13 billion light years away. And if you're not sure how far that is, because I can't, I can't fathom how, how far that is, I want to give you an idea. The sun, which is so far that we've never been able to send something to the sun. It's just too far away. The sun is like seven light minutes away from us. Seven light minutes. It takes light seven minutes to to go from the sun to here. That's how far away it is. And yet this telescope can see 13 billion light years away. You take that same telescope to the other side of the globe and you look in the other direction. You got another 13 billion light years of stuff on the other side where God has created really cool things. And the Bible says that God can go up to the entirety of the universe and he can measure it with the breadth of his hands. Go like this for me. This is a breadth. Pinky, as far away from your thumb as possible. God can walk up to 26 billion light years of creation and just measure it off with the breath of his hand. And so Job has just experienced the presence of God. 26 billion light years measured with the breath of his hand. And by the way, that's just God trying to give us a little bit of something we can wrap our heads around about how big he is. God's even bigger than that. God can't be measured. And so imagine if you experience the physical presence of God you would probably say, you know what? Oh, I belong sitting here among the dust and the ashes. You see, what worship really is, it's a, it's a recognition of how great God is in comparison to how little you are. How all-knowing God is and how little you know. How, how fair and just God is and how your version of justice is, is messed up. It's really a recognition, a perspective of God's goodness in compared to our brokenness. And so when you experience the presence of God, just like Job, you're going to find yourself on the ground in worship. Because nothing else would make sense at that moment. We see this also in Isaiah Chapter 6, Isaiah has just experienced the presence of God, and he says, Then I said, It's over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. You see, there's nothing that Isaiah can do in this moment that he's experienced the presence of God, but to essentially say, Ha, oh, I'm, I'm done. I'm toast. <laughs> Whatever's about to happen to me is probably not good. I've just experienced the presence of God. And in comparison, I am nothing. I'm as good as dead. Here's the third thing. Number three, the plan of God brings restoration. The plan of God brings restoration. So, so what happens right before this is God finishes speaking to Job And then he turns his attention to Job's three friends. He has nothing bad to say to Elihu. But he does turn to the three friends and he basically rebukes them for the words that they have said. He says, you guys were not speaking on my behalf. You were not being good friends. What you said was not true. And he rebukes them. And then he tells them to go and take uh, some burnt offerings and go and present them to God in front of Job. He says, and then Job will pray for you. Job will forgive you. And I will accept Job's prayer on your behalf and you will be forgiven. And so all this goes down. And then this is what happens. Job 42 verse 10. It says, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before. Remember, he was already the richest guy in the land. And now he's got twice as much as what he had before. Then all his brothers and sisters and former friends. I love that. 
the guys that were uh, fair weather friends, right? They were around when he had all the wealth. And as soon as all these things started to happen to Job, they like unfriended him real quick and blocked him on Instagram. And now they're like sending friend requests again, saying, Job, let's be friends. So all his former friends, they came and they feasted with him in his home and they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. And it says, and each of them brought a gift of money and a gold ring. The Bible goes on to explain all that restoration, all that God gave Job. I want you to understand, I'm not talking about God being in the business of restoration from a perspective of, of God uh, just being a name it and claim it. Like, hey, if you just honor God, you do the right thing, and God eventually wants to make you the richest person in the land. That's not what I'm saying. God might not make you the richest person in the land. You might continue to, to just barely get by. But I want you to know that if you're a follower of Jesus in this room, if you are a brother or sister in Christ, you have made the single most important decision you will ever make. And because you love and serve a God who is a God of restoration, one day you will be restored completely and fully in his presence. Because God is a God of restoration. And we get to see that exampled physically with Job. He gets more than he's ever had before. He gets even 10 new children, seven boys and three girls. And we, we end at a place where I'm so over time, I got to ask, listen, what, what now, God? All right, let's ask that question together. And here's what I want you to do. As our what now, God moment today, I would love it if every one of us were able to walk away today with a healthy understanding of what Job is all about. If someone were to ask you, hey, what is the book of Job about? What am I going to turn and learn uh, when, I, when I turn to Job? What am I going to learn? And I want to give you just a few things that you should be able to, to grasp onto. The first one, church, know that God is good and caring even when you don't feel like it. Can you say amen to that? God is good. I want you to amen each of these, all right? God is good and caring even when you don't feel like it. Another thing I want you to know is to expect hard things because we live in a broken world. We live in a place that's messed up. So don't be surprised when bad things happen to you, even if you didn't do anything to deserve it. Another thing I want you to know and take away is it's okay to ask hard questions. Just be respectful as you seek answers from God and, and know that you might not ever get the answer this side of heaven. God doesn't owe you an answer. The fourth thing we learn is that we can establish some core beliefs that will hold us in place while the storm is happening around us. Make sure you know some of those things we talked about on week three. Have those anchors that you can rely on when things are, are hard. And the fifth thing I want you to walk away with is just know that God is in the restoration business. And so we're gonna end with this verse. Here's what it says, the last verse in Job, verse 17 of 42, it says, and he died an old man who had lived a long, full life. We could translate that into a children's book ending, right? And Job lived happily ever after. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this book that you've included in your revelation to us. Thank you so much for the book of Job and how we get to learn so much about how you love us, how you've created us, how you care about us, even when we don't feel like it. And when things happen to us, uh, we, can, we can know that you still are in control, that your version of justice is better than ours. We can ask questions and come with some frustration, but at the end of the day, we need to be careful to, to trust uh, you, even if you don't want to answer those questions for us. And God, we thank you for, for loving Job. We thank you for being a God who restored him because you've modeled to us that you are a God of restoration and that one day you long to restore every one of us as well. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. 
Please remember this. You belong at ACC.